So today we're going to be preparing tooth number 14 for a full zirconia crown. This will be very similar to the preparation that we did on tooth number 30, only rather than a rounded shoulder margin, we're going to change to a chamfered margin. Both are acceptable with zirconia and uh, you, can, you can do it either way. So we wanted to show you that alternative. As with any preparation, the first thing you'll do is take a look at the occlusion, have the patient closed together and assess the occlusal relationship between the tooth that we're preparing and the opposing teeth. One of the things uh, on this typodont that becomes evident, even though this is a class one occlusion, there's more space, more interocclusal gap, if you will, between number 14 and tooth number 19 in the lower arch near the distal aspect by about a half a millimeter. So if we wanted to take advantage of that in terms of our occlusal reduction, we could reduce a little bit less and pay attention to the biology of the tooth, the biological aspect of tooth preparation and conserve a little bit of tooth structure. Now, if we did that, the lab would be forced to make the crown a little bit larger in that area, uh, but it's still, there's space so that it would fit. And that's one of the things that you need to decide when you're preparing teeth is, <clears throat> am I going to pay more attention to the reduction amount based upon the anatomy of the tooth I'm preparing, or, or are we going to be paying more attention to clearance? And that is the distance from the opposing tooth structure. That's primarily what we look at, but you have to realize that the shape of the overall result in the indirect restoration may change a little bit if you under-reduce because of pre-existing space that's already there. So we're gonna go ahead and reduce this uh, based upon the anatomy of tooth number uh, 19 and work off of clearance, but we're gonna start with guide cuts. So we start with guide cuts, we work off reduction amount, that reduces the occlusal surface geometrically, and then we'll fine tune it with clearance from the opposing tooth. So we'll take both into account. The very first thing we're going to do after checking occlusion is break proximal contacts. I like to do that with a 1557 burr because uh, it cuts very cleanly and cool with lots of water, which you'd be using clinically. Uh, also, the diamond that I'm going to be using in approximately is larger than that burr anyway. So as long as I keep this burr away from the adjacent tooth, I don't have to change burrs when I go to my uh, guide cuts and my occlusal reduction. So one of the things I like to do when uh, we're, we're working interproximally is work directly. I don't like to be looking through a mirror when I'm doing that. I want to have direct vision so that I can avoid uh, nicking or scraping the adjacent tooth. So on this tooth, we'd probably have our patient turn to the right, the patient's right as such. And then I would come over into the one o'clock position so that I could get direct vision. The other thing that you're going to be doing in a, in, with any upper tooth preparation like this is have your patient up quite high and tipped back so that you can have good access to the, to the entire upper arch. So we'll come over with direct vision and don't have an assistant, so I will use the suction here and we're gonna break proximal contact. I'll start with the distal. And just use little brush strokes. When you're breaking contact, you want to angle your burr so that the tip of it is aimed into the gingival embrasure. So it's aimed out in so you don't create a big ledge down at the base of where you're breaking contact. Always keeping one eye on the adjacent tooth as you do this. Just light brush strokes as you go.
sometimes there'll actually be a little sliver of tooth structure left in between your cut and the adjacent tooth as is forming here. And that's just keeping my distance from the adjacent tooth. So we'll carry on and uh, make it all the way to the lingual aspect there. As you're breaking through to the other side, the burr is going to want to walk itself around the tooth and it can throw you into the adjacent tooth if you're not careful. We'll move to the mesial now and we're going to tip the other way. The shape of the proximal surfaces on both tooth number 13, the premolar, and number 15, the molar, will dictate the angulation uh, of this, this burr cut, and it will be a little bit over tapered. We can't help that. Again, keep a little distance between you and the adjacent tooth, and just light brush strokes as you go. Don't let it throw you now into that adjacent tooth and we have contact broken and we're now ready to place guide cuts. I'm going to go ahead and put this down with our guide cuts. We're going to not go quite as deep on the distal because we've already got a little bit of space there anyway. The guide cuts you want to follow your triangular ridges and your major grooves. This burr is a millimeter in diameter so it's very handy for judging approximately one millimeter of tooth reduction. Our overall target clearance for this preparation is 1.5 to two millimeters. That's on the non-functional cusp, the functional cusp, and the functional cusp bevel. So all the way across the occlusion, 1.5 to two. So this will get me close and then I can refine it with the diamond afterwards. So we'll start with our guide cuts. And we'll start on the distal buckle. Triangular uh, ridge. And there's a little bit left of that uh, distal buckle groove too. So I will go ahead and use, I'll put a guide cut there as well. So we're now on the triangular ridge for the mesial buckle cusp. We don't have much of a uh, mesial buckle groove, so we, we took that off with our uh, with breaking contact, so we'll just leave that one alone. We'll come over now to uh, our major lingual groove right there. The mesial lingual cusp of an upper molar is very large. It's, it's twice the size of the distal lingual cusp. So while the buccal uh, aspect of the tooth preparation will pretty much be divided in half between the mesial buccal cusp and the, and the distal buccal cusp, the lingual aspect will be approximately one-third on the distal lingual and then two-thirds uh, on the mesial lingual because that's such a large uh, functional cusp. These uh, uh, reduction guides, these, these grooves that I'm going to be making on this mesial lingual cusp will be fairly flat. This aspect of that cusp is fairly flat all the way across it. So I'm going to put a couple of guide cuts there. This is our, uh, our oblique ridge. And then we'll carry on another one, just right in the center of that large cusp. And then we'll put one at the mesial aspect. And these are all close to in line with, with one another.
There's a little bit left on the distal lingual groove right here. We'll do that. Be careful not to slip and hit number 15. And then while we're at it, we just as well add the uh, grooves, the reduction guide for uh, the functional cusp bevel. So we'll start by just carrying that lingual groove right across to the, the palatal aspect, basically, of the tooth. And then I'll put a, I'll put a reduction guide cut right here on that distal lingual cusp, and then we'll add a couple across this part of the mesial lingual cusp. And so our guide cuts would look something, something like that, and then we'll simply connect the guide cuts. When you're preparing a mandibular molar for a full coverage crown, very important to, uh, to get your occlusal clearance correct on the functional cusp bevel early on because that then gives you access to the, the rest of the functional cusp and the non-functional cusp, which are further inside toward the tongue. On the upper arch, it's just the opposite. You want to get the clearance right on your uh, non-functional cusp, which is out and very accessible on the buccal cusp, and then uh, work inward from there, work palatally. And once you gain access out where you have, again, where it's very accessible, so we'll move now to the non-functional cusp here. We're just connecting guide cuts. And I've tried to keep them just a little bit lighter, not quite as deep, toward the distal because I already have a half millimeter or so of space right at the very uh, distal aspect. And so I'm going to take advantage of that and be biologically friendly to the tooth. We'll be just a little bit more conservative. You can't always do that. Sometimes you need to closely duplicate the shape of the, of the tooth that you're preparing. But there are times like this where we don't, don't need to. We can take up that little bit of space with the restoration. So we've done the rough occlusal reduction. At this point, we can simply uh, stop and take a look. And uh, I, I'm still, uh, you can tell, I reduced just about as much on the distal as I did on the mesial, uh, not intending to necessarily. So I'm going to need to keep that in mind as I do my final uh, refinement of that, that uh, occlusal, um, the occlusal reduction aspect of the preparation. You can tell there's, just, there's still a little bit more gap toward the distal. So I'll try to compensate for that when I move to the diamond, which is what I will do next. So the 1557 goes, and now we bring in the 6878K018 diamond. And uh, this is a very, uh, this is a workhorse diamond. It's got a chamfer tip. It comes to a point, uh, unlike your rounded shoulder torpedo type diamonds. Uh, and so we'll put this diamond in Knowing that we need to reduce a little more toward the mesial, we'll, ca we'll carry on now.
And again, we're going to try to take off a little more toward the mesial aspect. Be careful when you're up here that this burr doesn't crawl over the edge and either go down the uh, axial wall or into, worse yet, into the proximal, proximal tooth. This oblique ridge um, on these upper molars has uh, quite a difference in, in height. There's quite a step down usually to get to that distal lingual cusp. And so we'll try to emphasize that now, knowing that, yeah, I, I want it there, but I want to be a little careful not to over reduce on the distal because we're trying to trying to be a little, little bit conservative of our of our tooth structure. Let's see how we're how we're doing now. Getting closer, I need to do a better job of mirroring the opposing occlusion. And you can see where it's especially close near the mesial buccal cusp. And so I'm going to take off a little more structure there to even that up. This is a time where you'd have your patient open and close quite a number of times to help you nicely mirror the opposing the opposing occlusion okay that's getting better we're going to take a little bit more still and we're going to move that uh, ridge a little bit to the mesial also close. Okay, it's coming along. We're probably slightly over reduced on the distal. I'll leave it that way. That's just fine. And we're about right now on the on the mesial. I could maybe move that triangular ridge a little bit more to the mesial. And so we'll we'll do that. Now we'll, uh, we'll refine on in. Now at this point, you could easily get out uh, your red stick, which is 1.5 millimeters in diameter. And you could just double check your measurements with this, with this red stick on your non-functional cusp and then moving into the functional cusp like that from the distal and then also from from the mesial and it looks like we have the clearance that we need. I'll come over here. You might be able to see a little better if I do that. So again, functional cusp is fine on the, or excuse me, non-functional cusp is fine. Functional cusp, we've got to do a little more reducing. So that, that we're not able to quite get this 1.5 to work up that slope. So this area through here now needs to be reduced. And then, of course, we'll work on the functional cusp bevel as well. So let's take a little bit more off there. And 
let's check that again. See if we're able to start getting this, uh, this red stick. While it's not a perfect way to measure, it does help. And now, now it's starting to fit in there on the functional cusp. So I can tell that we're getting very close and we can turn our attention now to the functional cusp bevel. One of the things that, that easily happens when we're preparing these upper molars and uh, doing our occlusal reduction is we transpose the, the lingual groove. That lingual groove is a large groove that goes from distal buccal towards the mesial lingual and it's very easy to take that groove and straighten it out so that it goes more straight lingual and that, that's not the anatomy of the tooth. Maintain the direction of that distal lingual groove as it goes from distal buccal towards mesial lingual. So you need to hold your handpiece at an angle to, in order to maintain that. So we'll continue that with our functional cusp bevel and reduce that now a little bit more. The angle of your burr on the functional cusp bevel is pretty much parallel to the angle of reduction out here on the non-functional cusp. So if you simply went from there in, this functional cusp bevel is about at that same, that same angle. So uh, let's see visually if we're in the ballpark, and it looks like we are. Let's, uh, let's check with our little measuring stick here and see see if we're starting yeah and, and i'm able to get that all the way across now it doesn't just blow through i do have to work at it a little bit which is good you don't want it to just blow through you're probably over reduced if that's the case but i can get that through there now so our occlusal uh, reduction is almost done i can see a couple of places there i want to just dress up a little bit uh, and most of that will, uh, will actually be dressed up when we do our rounding. So I'll save that till, till the end. We pretty much have the occlusal reduction done now. So next we move to axial reduction. And as with the lower molar, where the lower molars have a slight lingual inclination to the axis of the tooth, and you want to maintain that, in the long axis of your preparation, in the path of insertion that you're creating. Well, upper molars do just the opposite. They go out toward the buckle just a little bit. And so we want to maintain the axis of our preparation. And we're going to line that axis up with our buckle axial reduction first. Now, occasionally on uh, upper first molars, which this is, it's necessary to, to do the, the facial surface or the buccal surface in two planes. And that depends a little bit on where the axis ends up. And we'll talk more about that later. Uh, but we may have to use two planes on this to get adequate reduction for this preparation. It, it really does depend on where our final axis ends up. Upper second molars and upper first molars sometimes need a second facial plane and sometimes they do not. Anything anterior to that, anything mesial to an upper first molar, it needs two facial planes of reduction. So from premolars all the way to the anterior teeth, we reduce those in two planes, both to conserve tooth structure and to improve our resistance and retention form. So uh, because I've cut the occlusal surface off of number uh, 14, sometimes it's a little difficult to tell where the axis of the tooth actually is. So go back to 15. We'll line our, uh, our burr up with that axis of 15. It's, got, it's going out to the buckle just slightly. And then we simply bring it forward and start the, the preparation there. This is something that you want to uh, check yourself on from time to time as you're doing that. And I could get my suction going now, keep it a little cleaner here. But again, I'm gonna check, before I go back in, I'm gonna check 
key off of 15 and then I'm going to move it forward and just start that buckle axial reduction. All I'm doing at this point is lining it up. I'm not getting very close to the gum line. I'm not going into full depth. I'm just keying off that tooth behind it and getting my axis right. Once I start to develop that axial wall, then I can come out and look at it directly and with a mirror and begin to refine it as we as we approach as we approach the gum line. So I'm going to lay that burr right up against that axial wall to keep my axis straight and in line. And now as I go in axially, our axial depth is very similar. We want to be about one millimeter. With a chamfer diamond, it's much more difficult to use some kind of a measuring instrument to verify your uh, axial reduction because it's a long sloping margin uh, and you're reducing all of your reference points in the very act of taking that buckle wall off. So you have to uh, kind of get used to what that uh, proper depth looks like. With this big 6878K018 diamond, uh, it's, a very, uh, it's a very easy diamond to put a nice, robust chamfer margin. Now, as we come in proximal here, I've got to be real careful. I'm going to stop near the line angle there and then come back and just Gonna blend that. Let's check ourselves again. Looks like we're still good. We haven't transposed our axis, so we're gonna just keep going here. It does need to be a little deeper, so we're gonna carry that on. We want to end up about 0.5 millimeters super gingival. It's always easier to go a little more gingival later on than it is to try to add to it if you cut too much off. So just kind of be careful at this stage. I'm going to start to angle this so I don't hit that premolar. And let's get an idea if, our, if we're uh, deep enough axially. Still not, not deep enough. We need to go in further. We're probably, uh, oh, maybe 0.75 now in terms of uh, axial depth. check again and see how we're doing from that standpoint. So we're about right at the straight buckle. So now we're going to uh, try to even that up. And I will need to work through the mirror on this. It would be very easy with an assistant to keep your mirror nice and clean for you. And we'll go a little deeper toward the mesial buckle. Okay, so I think we just uh, kind of dress that up, smooth it up now.
and our buckle is uh, pretty well done now. So we're going to extend in approximately, and, and again, as I said before, you want to come over in about the one or two o'clock position, have that patient tip back and, and over to the right so you can get in and see. We're going to use our mirror so we can kind of see it from the other side also. And uh, we'll start with the distal. I'm actually going to take a little bit of this off back in here on the lingual aspect, work down from that just to get that out of the way. A little bit extra tooth structure. I'm going to do the same over here where it's a little bit, a uh, little bit extra tooth. So now I can focus more on that that axial wall and not so much on having the wall push me into the adjacent tooth. So you have to kind of line up the, the this tooth number 15 is has a mesial proximal surface that's really sloped. And so you do have to follow that, and, and, and it will create a little bit of an over-taper, mesial to distal, that's okay. Uh, but line the burr up with as much getting those axial walls um, less tapered, as, as little taper as possible, based upon what those proximal tooth surfaces will allow you to do. So we'll work on the distal. Always keep one eye back on that adjacent tooth. Keep in mind that the further gingival you go, the further away you're going to get from that adjacent tooth, which is kind of handy. So don't be too timid and feel like you can't go in a gingival direction because you will actually just make it a little harder on yourself. And then we'll do the mesial aspect the same way. I want to dress that up just a little bit. Okay, now we'll come to the mesial. And we're getting pretty close. We'll deepen that chamfer just a little bit, which is kind of nice because it'll allow us to uh, reduce the taper mesial to distal, and so now we have uh, our buccal axial wall uh, pretty much finished. We may put a second plane in there, we'll evaluate that later, a uh, second plane of reduction, and we've pretty much completed our interproximal. Now we're going to the lingual axial wall, and as long as you've lined everything up properly, uh, off of your uh, your landmarks and you have the axis going in the right direction it's very easy to line up the lingual axial wall with the buccal axial wall so you line your handpiece up based upon that wall you simply keep it parallel bring it to the lingual and start your reduction as you're doing so um, every so often just kind of stop compare and then go back and just verify that you haven't gotten too far off track. Check to make sure that we're not either creating an undercut or over tapering. It looks like we're fine that way. This is a part that is often left neglected, especially as students are just learning to do these preparations, is you'll get the mesial and distal and buccal and lingual okay, but you will 
not blend the line angles where they where they run into each other. sure that we blend that at the mesial. And we have a little more to do there. Trying to get that axial depth as uniform as I can, all the way around the tooth. So, uh, we, I believe, are just about there. I've got a little bit of a raggedy margin right there. I'm gonna blow it off for just a second. Yeah, there's a couple of places on the margin. I want to just refine it a little bit. And if you uh, take your, your uh, handpiece right down to stall out just about, and just real slow and easy, you can kind of sand those irregularities out. That's better. So uh, let's look and see if we need that two plane facial reduction. And to me, it looks like we do. And the way you tell, the way you determine that is we're going to look down the facial aspects of all of these uh, teeth. And if it looks like the contours of your preparation are going to create a thin spot in the restorative material out here, then you do need to add a second facial plane. And, and it does look like that to me. If we can, if you can see how I, I'm looking at the contours of all of these unprepared teeth, and you can see how uh, this is kind of sticking out into where that restorative space would be. If we were to imagine uh, a crown over the top of this tooth, it's going to be a little thin right through here. And when you see that happen, uh, then you need to put that second plane in. And we'll talk about how to do how to do that next. But this does need an additional uh, second facial plane in order to give us uh, the right reduction amounts for the restorative material that we're using. These planes, um, the junction between there is a gingival plane and, a, and an occlusal and they're basically divided at the junction between the gingival third and the middle third so uh, when we add this second facial plane in uh, we're gonna we're gonna create it will be longer it will be a longer aspect of that buccal wall than the gingival aspect the junction between the two will be in right at the occlusal aspect of the gingival third. So this is done by keying off the adjacent tooth. So this, this uh, second molar behind, if I look at the contours of that and lay my, my burr up against that, that's going to help me determine what angle I'm gonna cut this second facial plane in. So we'll do that and, and uh, I'll lay it up against here and then go ahead and do it. This is something that doesn't take long, but it makes a big difference restoratively. The reason that we don't do it right in the beginning is that it can interfere with our ability to line up axial walls. And notice how its junction is right down in that at the top or the occlusal aspect of the gingival third. So it ends up being a gingival third and an occlusal two thirds. And I need to angle it just a little more still.
and we're getting awfully close now but that that helps restoratively we'll smooth that out you can see now how our preparation is well within the confines of the shapes of all of those teeth along there so this has been brought in now and it basically uh, is very similar to the tooth behind it and the teeth in front of it. The angle change occurs right down here between the gingival third and the middle third of the tooth. And so this is two thirds of that buccal wall. And this little bit right down here by the gum line is one third of that buccal wall. That's the part of the buccal wall that is lined up with this opposing axial wall on the lingual. This now is a little bit over tapered. So will it aid in resistance and retention form? Absolutely. But our primary uh, aspect of these uh, axial walls is this gingival third down here. So once that's done, all, that's really, all that really remains is our non-functional cusp bevel and then rounding. Now with this particular preparation, the uh, uh, rounding, if we're going to use zirconia, is not near as important as if, it, uh, as if we were using lithium disilicate. Uh, lithium disilicate is a much, it's a much less strong ceramic and requires that we round everything internally or it creates stress points. Zirconia, on the other hand, it can handle it. But if you use this, uh, this preparation design and round those internal line angles and point angles, it does help. Uh, so now uh, that we've, we've put in that second facial plane, uh, let's put in our non-functional cusp bevel. It's about one millimeter wide. It fades at the mesial and distal. And all it's doing is bisecting this sharp angle that's created out here between our, our buccal ax axial reduction and the occlusal reduction on the non-functional cusp. So let's line our burr up. And do that. And that's, that's it. That's the non-functional cusp bevel. And uh, I do need to do a little more on my functional cusp bevel right here that I can see. I'm gonna do that now. And now it is time to round. Um, and again, with the zirconia, it's not critical that we do too much, but we do want to soften any, and when I say round, this isn't really rounding, we're just softening real sharp, sharp angles of the preparation. Marginal ridges are notorious for having sharp spots. Look at your preparation from all different angles. Make sure you're not missing anything. And we are finished.